calculating what happens to an uh, electromagnetic plane wave at normal incidence to a boundary between two different linear media is not difficult. Hi, I'm Jonathan Gardner, and this is Section 824 of Introduction to Electrodynamics by Griffiths, second edition, of course. We recently covered the nature of EM plane waves. We've just covered what happens inside of linear media and what conditions must be satisfied at the boundary. This video is a little bit long. Uh, there really isn't a good place to break it up in the middle, so you grab your notepad and pencil and take notes and get ready for a major brain dump. Um, I just said that it's not complicated. The, the trick is that there's a lot of details you have to keep in mind and, and you have to understand where everything comes from. Um, so the situation is we have a boundary between two linear media. On the left side we have uh, epsilon 1, mu, mu 1, which of course leads to a velocity 1 and an index of refraction 1. On the other side we have epsilon 2, mu 2, v2, and n2. And uh, when you have a, a, a plane wave approaching from the left side, I'll use hot pink for the incident wave. This is the wave that comes towards that boundary. And then uh, the, the wave that gets uh, transmitted through is called the transmitted wave. And the wave that bounces off is called the reflected R wave. We'll use green for that. So this is a reflected wave. Remember, these are plane waves. and these. Uh, so the electric fields and the, the magnetic fields are all per parallel to that plane. Um, it comes in with the E fields moving up and down like this as you get closer to the middle. Um, we don't have any E fields pointing this direction or any B fields pointing that direction. So the equations for these waves can be uh, given by this. So the, the incident electric wave is a complex. Uh, it's only determined by the x coordinate and the time. Um, in the y and z dimensions, it's all going to be the same. That's equal to sum e naught i. Uh, it's a complex number, has a phase constant in there, times e to the i kappa i x minus omega i t. And it'll be pointing in the j hat direction. Uh, you should be able to reorient whatever problem you've been given so that it does point in this direction. The B field um, is given by um, basically uh, it's just basically uh, one over v one e not i complex e uh, to the i kappa one x minus omega I'm sorry kappa i x I'm getting ahead of myself there and it will be pointing in the k hat direction okay. Um, so basically it's the same as the E field except for this denominator V1 and it's pointing in a different direction. The uh, reflected wave is traveling backwards so it's going to have a minus sign in there. 1, uh, no it's just E not R complex E to the I minus kappa R X minus omega R T in the J hat direction and the B field is pretty much the same except for that constant of v1 and then e naught r complex e to the i minus kappa r x minus omega r t in the k hat direction it's in the minus k hat direction because it has to be uh um it has to be pointed in that direction to satisfy the the wave equation so then we have um e t Vector complex is a function of x and t. It's equal to e naught t complex e to the i kappa t x minus omega t t in the j hat direction. And the b field, 1 over v2 e naught t complex e to the i kappa t x minus omega t t in the k hat direction and I forgot a curly over the B field and the incident wave. Alright, now the total electric field the total electric field um, is basically it's going to be the incident electric field plus the reflected electric field when x is less than zero and it's going to be the transmitted electric field 
when x is greater than 0. These are vectors, I'm sorry. And the same for the b. So when x is less than 0, and b t vector complex when x is greater than 0. Um, now all we have to do is apply the boundary conditions that we discussed earlier and uh, we should be able to find how these nine constants, let me see if I can circle the nine constants for you that, the, that we have to find. So we have to find e naught i, e naught r, e naught t. These are complex numbers so we're going to need the magnitude, the real, and the uh, the imaginary parts which will be determined by the magnitude electric field at its maximum and the uh, phase shift. And then we have kappa i, kappa r, kappa t, omega i, omega r, omega t. Okay, those nine constants, if we figure that out, we'll know everything we need to know. So the, the uh, boundary conditions, let me write them out very quickly here. We have the first one says that epsilon 1 of E1 in the perpendicular direction to the boundary has to equal epsilon 2 E2 of the perpendicular. Well, this is epsilon 1 on the left side has to equal epsilon 2 on the right side. Um, or the electric field on the left side has to equal the electric field on the right side in the perpendicular direction. Well, this is trivial since uh, the perpendicular component of E is always equal to zero. Then we have the, the B vector, uh, field has to equal the B field uh, in the perpendicular direction. Again, the B field perpendicular is equal to zero. This isn't true when we're doing um, oblique incidence, when we're coming at an angle to the surface. But it is true for the normal incidence. There's just there's no E field or B field perpendicular to that plane. So there's no E field, B fields there. So these are trivially satisfied. The one that gets interesting um, uh, is this one that says your parallel E field has to equal the parallel E field on the other side. Okay? And so this says basically these guys have to equal these guys on either side. And then we have the other one that says uh, 1 over mu 1 B1 parallel has to equal 1 over mu 2 E2 parallel. Okay, and that's going to be satisfied um, basically saying these guys have to equal these guys, but with the, the, co the coefficients there. Okay, so let's do the algebra there. So let's take that third boundary condition that says the parallel E fields have to equal each other. And let's write it out this way. So we have E naught, er, E naught I complex and E to the I and uh, because we're at x equals 0, this, this term is going to be 0 right here for all three of these equations. So, so all three of those E fields. So we're just going to use omega t. So minus omega incident t plus e naught r e to the i minus omega r t has to equal e naught t e to the i minus omega t t. Okay? And the thing that you should recognize right away is that these thingamabobs, the, the terms that depend on the time, must be equal to each other, right? They basically have to have the same factor. And so this is where, why we know that the omegas have to equal, and we'll just call that omega now. And because of that, um, Remember, kappa and omega are related to each other through the medium. So I'm going to say that kappa incident has to equal kappa reflected. And I'm just going to call that kappa 1 because it's the kappa on the left side. And then I'm going to call kappa t, the transmitted kappa, just kappa 2 because it's the kappa on the other side. Right? That's, that's a direct result because the omega is equal for everything. Um, the second thing is once we've got those equal, then we're left with these three terms. And it says that the E naught I uh, complex plus the E naught R complex has to equal the E naught T complex. Okay, that's going to be an important. Um, hopefully, when when you uh, re-examine the boundary conditions for the string waves, you'll recognize this as being one of the criti the critical components to the equation that allows us to solve how they all relate to each other. Uh, for the B fields, we get this equation. We get 1 over mu 1 v1. Is it v? Yes, it's v. And then we have e not i complex e to the 
i omega minus i omega t plus plus no it's a minus because the reflective points the opposite direction e to the minus i omega t has to equal 1 over mu 2 v2 e naught t complex e to the minus i omega t and that was a terrible omega that's okay though so um, this one you simplify to say that e naught i complex minus e naught r complex is equal to mu 1 v1 over mu 2 v2 e naught t complex because these e to the i omega t's are all going to be equal you can factor them out and we're just going to rename mu1 v1 over mu2 v2 as beta e naught t okay so that's the second equation um, now using those two equations we can solve how uh, the e naughts relate to each other so we have e naught r vector complex has to equal uh, it's not a vector i'm sorry e naught r has to equal uh, 1 minus beta over 1 plus beta e naught t complex um, and then we have e, um, no, e naught i e naught t complex has to equal 2 over 1 plus beta e naught i okay okay and from this um, we get a couple of interesting conclusions one is that um, the phase constant so these are always going to be equal to each other by some real number and so the, they're always going to be in phase with each other so the the transmitted delta is going to be equal to the transmitted phase constant and we can just rewrite this as the real magnitude the maximum that you get is just one plus beta the real of the incident right right there okay and that's a very useful result it tells you how much is transmitted through it's based only on beta the the word the weirdness comes over here is beta could be greater than or less than one if beta is bigger than one then e naught r is going to be the negative of e naught i and the way you can represent that because it's complex numbers you just add 80 degrees 180 degrees to the phase constant so if beta is greater than one then e naught r is equal to um, one minus beta over one plus beta absolute value and then we're going to say the phase constant of the r is going to be equal to the phase constant of the incident plus 180 degrees but if beta is less than one then we just basically say e naught r is equal to one minus beta one plus beta e naught i and then the phase of those two are equal okay it depends on whether beta is big or little and that is pretty much everything um, beta is a little bit messy to work with and you might notice that for most materials the mu's are pretty much equal right and so if we take the assumption or the simplification so if mu1 is about equal to mu2 which is true for most materials then beta is about equal to um, v1 over v2 and we can rewrite the equations as e is equal to um, v2 minus v1 over v2 plus v1 okay with the same notes if v2 is as v1 is greater than v2 then delta r equals delta t plus 180 right or that's that's the same conditions um, otherwise if v2 is less than v1 I'm sorry v1 is less than v2 then delta r is equal to delta t okay and then we have, we can rewrite e naught t as equal to 2 over v2 plus v1 of e naught i and I apologize for my handwriting I don't know why it's so horrible today um, and with that uh, we can also rewrite these in terms of the index refraction which is much easier to measure than the velocity um, n1 minus n2 over n1 plus n2 e naught t and then uh, i i i i did I miss anything else equals 2 over n1 plus n2 e naught i Okay, so that's two different ways to write these equations. 
da 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 Okay, and that only works if you have this condition that mu1 is about equal to mu2. Um, last word is on intensity. So intensity, remember that's the average of the um, of the energy um, transmitted, is just one half epsilon times velocity times e naught squared. That's what it is. And so if we take the ratio, um, reflection coefficient is the ratio of the intensity of the reflection divided by the intensity of the incident. And that will just basically give us it's the square of those, right? Which the ratio of that is just basically n1 plus n2 over n1. Ah, this is a minus, not a plus. And that's that's what you get for the reflection coefficient. For the transmission coefficient, that's just the intensity of the transmission divided by the intensity of the incident. That's a little more complicated. Uh, we have E2 V2 over E1 V1 times um, E naught T over E naught I and all that squared. And that can simplify down to N2 over N1 times 2 N1 over N1 plus N2. And that's squared, okay? That's the uh, the coefficients there, and if, as a little algebra exercise, you can prove for yourself that r plus t has to equal one, that the reflection and transmission has to equal one. Um, so next, we're going to cover what happens at uh, oblique incidents when you're coming at an angle to that surface. This is actually a special case where the incident angle is 90 degrees, um, as you'll see. Um, so it's a little bit more complicated, but I think we've covered most of the basics here. Um, very similar reasoning, and you'll have some fun with that one. Um, if you have any questions or comments, you can share them in the comments below or a video response. Uh, be sure to like this video, share it with your friends, and thank you for your time. Take care. Bye.